Book 8. The Songs of the Harper. Under the opening fingers of the dawn Alcanus, the sacred prince, arose, and then arose Odysseus, raider of cities. As the king willed, they went down by the shipways to the assembly ground of the Phaeacians. Side by side the two men took their ease there on smooth stone benches. Meanwhile Pallas Athena roamed through the byways of the town, contriving Odysseus' voyage home, in voice and feature the crier of the king Alcanus who stopped and passed the word to every man, Phaeacian lords and counselors, this way. Come to assembly, learn about the stranger, the new guest at the palace of Alcanus, a man the sea drove, but a comely man, the god's own light is on him. She aroused them, and soon the assembly ground and seats were filled with curious men, a throng who peered and saw the mastermind of war, Laertes' son. Athena now poured out her grace upon him, head and shoulders, height and mass, a splendor awesome to the eyes of the Phaeacians, she put him in a fettle to win the day. Mastering every trial they set to test him. When all the crowd sat marshaled, quieted, Alcanus addressed the full assembly, hear me, lords and captains of the Phaeacians. Hear what my heart would have me say. Our guest and new friend, nameless to me still, comes to my house after long wandering in dawn lands or among the sunset races. Now he appeals to me for conveyance home. As in the past, therefore, let us provide passage, and quickly, for no guest of mine languishes here for lack of it. Look to it, get a black ship AF load on the noble sea, and pick our fastest sailor, draft a crew of two and fifty from our younger townsmen, townsmen, men who have made their names at sea. Loop oars well to your tholpins, lads, then leave the ship, come to our house, fall to, and take your supper, we'll furnish out a feast for every crewman. These are your orders. As for my older peers and princes of the realm, let them foregather in festival for our friend in my great hall, and let no man refuse. Call in our minstrel, Demodokos, whom God made lord of song, heart, easing, sing upon what theme he will. He turned, led the procession, and those princes followed, while his herald sought the minstrel. Young oarsmen from the assembly chose a crew of two and fifty, as the king commanded, and these filed off along the waterside to where the ship lay, poised above open water. They hauled the black hull down to ride the sea, rigging a mast and spar in the black ship, with oars at trail from corded rawhide, all seemingly, then tried the white sail, hoisting, and moored her off the beach. Then going ashore the crew went up to the great house of Alcanus. Here the enclosures, entrance ways, and rooms were filled with men, young men and old, for whom Alcanus had put twelve sheep to sacrifice, eight tuskers, and a pair of shambling oxen. These, now, they flayed and dressed to make their banquet. The crier soon came, leading that man of song whom the muse cherished, by her gift he knew the good of life, and evil, for she who lent him sweetness made him blind. Pontinus fixed a studded chair for him hard by a pillar amid the banqueters, hanging the taut harp from a peg above him, and guided up his hands upon the strings, placed a bread basket at his side, and poured wine in a cup, that he might drink his fill. Now each man's hand went out upon the banquet. In time, when hunger and thirst were turned away, the muse brought to the minstrel's mind a song of heroes whose great fame rang under heaven, the clash between Odysseus and Achilles, how one time they contended at the god-feast raging, and the marshal, Agamemnon, felt inward joy over his captain's quarrel, for such had been foretold him by Apollo at Pytho, hallowed height, when the Achaean crossed that portal of rock to ask a sign, in the old days when grim war lay ahead for Trojans' end. Danans, by God's will. So ran the tale the minstrel sang. Odysseus with massive hand drew his rich mantle down over his brow, cloaking his face with it, to make the Phaeacians miss the secret tears that started to his eyes. How skillfully he dried them when the song came to a pause. Threw back his mantle, spilt his gout of wine. But soon the minstrel plucked his note once more to please the Phaeacian lords, who loved the song, then in his cloak Odysseus wept again. His tears flowed in the mantle unperceived, only Alcanus, at his elbow, saw them, and caught the low groan in the man's breathing. At once he spoke to all the sea folk round him, Hear me, lords and captains of the Phaeacians. Our meat is shared, our hearts are full of pleasure from the clear harp tone that accords with feasting, now for the field and track, we shall have trials in the pentathlon. Let our guest go home and tell his friends what champions we are at boxing, wrestling, broad jump and foot racing. 
On this he led the way and all went after. The crier unslung and pegged the shining harp and, taking Demodokos's hand, led him along with all the rest, Phaeakian peers, gay amateurs of the great games. They gained the common, where a crowd was forming, and many a young athlete now came forward with seaside names like Tipmast, Tiderace, Sparwood, Holman, Sternman. Beecher and Pullerman, Bluewater, Shearwater, Running Wake, Bordelli, Seabelt, son of Grand Fleet Shipwrightson, Searich stepped up, son of the launching master, rugged as Ares, bane of men, his build excelled all but the Prince Laodamas, and Laodamas made entry with his brothers, Halios and Clytonius, sons of the king. The runners, first, must have their quarter mile. All lined up tense, then go. And down the track they raised the dust in a flying bunch, strung out longer and longer behind Prince Clytonius. By just so far as a mule team, breaking ground, will distance oxen, he left all behind and came up to the crowd, an easy winner. Then they made room for wrestling, grinding bouts that sear each one, pinning the strongest men, then the broad jump, first place went to sea belt, Sparwood gave the discus the mightiest fling and Prince Laodamas outboxed them all. Now it was he, the son of Alcanus, who said when they had run through these diversions, look here, friends, we ought to ask the stranger if he competes in something. He's no cripple, look at his leg muscles and his forearms. Neck like a bollard, strong as a bull, he seems, and not old, though he may have gone stale under the rough times he had. Nothing like the sea for wearing out the toughest man alive. Then Sirich took him up at once and said, Laodamas, you're right, by all the powers. Go up to him, yourself, and put the question. At this, Alcanus' tall son advanced to the center ground, and there addressed Odysseus, friend, excellency, come join our competition, if you are practiced, as you seem to be. While a man lives he wins no greater honor than footwork, and the skill of hands can bring him. Enter our games, then, ease your heart of trouble. Your journey home is not far off, remember, the ship is launched, the crew all primed for sea. Odysseus, canniest of men, replied, Laodamas, why do you young chaps challenge me? I have more on my mind than track and field, hard days and many have I seen and suffered. I sit here at your field meet, yes, but only as one who begs your king to send him home. Now Sirich put his word in, and contentiously, the reason being, as I see it, friend, you never learned a sport, and have no skill in any of the contests of fighting men. You must have been the skipper of some tramp that crawled from one port to the next, jam full of chaffering hands, a taller of cargoes, itching for gold, not, by your looks, an athlete. Odysseus frowned and eyed him coldly, saying, that was uncalled for, friend, you talk like a fool. The gods deal out no gift, this one or any, birth, brains, or speech, to every man alike. In looks a man may be a shade, a specter, and yet be master of speech so crowned with beauty that people gaze at him with pleasure. Courteous, sure of himself, he can command assemblies, and when he comes to town, the crowds gather. A handsome man, contrarywise, may lack grace and good sense in everything he says. You now, for instance, with your fine physique, a god's, indeed, you have an empty noddle. I find my heart inside my ribs aroused by your impertinence. I am no stranger to contests, as you fancy. I rated well when I could count on youth and my two hands. Now pain has cramped me, and my years of combat hacking through ranks in war, and the bitter sea. I. Even so I'll give your games a trial. You spoke heart, wounding words. You shall be answered. He leapt out, cloaked as he was, and picked a discus, a rounded stone, more ponderous than those already used by the Phaeacian throwers, and whirling, let it fly from his great hand with a low hum. The crowd went flat on the ground, all those or, pulling, seafaring Phaeacians, under the rushing noise. The spinning disc soared out, light as a bird, beyond all others. Disguised now as a Phaeacian, Athena staked it and called out, even a blind man, friend, could judge this, finding with his fingers one discus, quite alone, beyond the cluster. Congratulations, this event is yours, not a man here can beat you or come near you. That was a cheering hail, Odysseus thought, seeing one friend there on the emulous field, so, in relief, he turned among the Phaeacians and said, now come alongside that. One, lads. The next I'll send as far, I think, or farther. 
Anyone else on edge for competition try me now. By heaven, you angered me. Racing, wrestling, boxing, I bar nothing with any man except Laotomas, for he's my host. Who quarrels with his host? Only a madman, or no man at all, would challenge his protector among strangers, cutting the ground away under his feet. Here are no others I will not engage, none but I hope to know what he is made of. Inept at combat, am I? Not entirely. Give me a smooth bow, I can handle it, and I might well be first to hit my man amid a swarm of enemies, though archers and company around me drew together. Philoctetes alone, at Troy, when we Achaeans took the bow, used to outshoot me. Of men who now eat bread upon the earth I hold myself the best hand with a bow, conceding mastery to the men of old, Heracles, or your Eidos of Oechalia, heroes who vied with gods in bowmanship. Your Eidos came to grief, it's true, old age never crept over him in his long haul, Apollo took his challenge ill and killed him. What then, the spear? I'll plant it like an arrow. Only in sprinting, I'm afraid, I may be passed by someone. Roll of the sea waves wearied me, and the victuals in my ship ran low, my legs are flabby. When he finished, the rest were silent, but Alcanus answered, Friend, we take your challenge in good part, for this man angered and, angered and affronted you here at our peaceful games. You'd have us note the prowess that is in you, and so clearly, no man of sense would ever cry it down. Come, turn your mind, now, on a thing to tell among your peers when you are home again, dining in hall, beside your wife and children, I mean our prowess, as you may remember it, for we too, have our skills, given by Zeus, and practiced from our father's time to this, not in the boxing ring nor the palestra conspicuous, but in racing, land or sea, and all our days we set great store by feasting, harpers, and the grace of dancing choirs, changes of dress, warm baths, and downy beds. O master dancers of the Phaeacians, perform now, let our guest on his return tell his companions we excel the world in dance and song, as in our ships and running. Someone go find the gittern harp and hall and bring it quickly to Demodokos. At the serene king's word, a squire ran to bring the polished harp out of the palace, and place was given to nine referees, peers of the realm, masters of ceremony, who cleared a space and smoothed a dancing floor. The squire brought down and gave Demodokos the clear, toned harp, and centering on the minstrel magical young dancers formed a circle with a light beat and stamp of feet. Beholding, Odysseus marveled at the flashing ring. Now to his harp the blinded minstrel sang of Ares' dalliance with Aphrodite, how hidden in Hephaestus' house they played at love together, and the gifts of Ares, dishonoring Hephaestus' bed, and how the word that wounds the heart came to the master from Helios, who had seen the two embrace and when he learned it, Lord Hephaestos went with baleful calculation to his forge. There mightily he armed his anvil block and hammered out a chain, whose tempered links could not be sprung or bent, he meant that they should hold. Those shackles fashioned, hot in wrath Hephaestos climbed to the bower and the bed of love, pulled all his net of chain around the bedposts and swung it from the rafters. Overhead, light as a cobweb even gods in bliss could not perceive, so wonderful his cunning. Seeing his bed now made a snare, he feigned a journey to the trim stronghold of Lemnos, the dearest of Earth's towns to him. And Ares? Ah, golden Ares watch had its reward when he beheld the great smith leaving home. How promptly to the famous door he came, intent on pleasure with sweet Cytherea. She, who had left her father's side, but now, sat in her chamber when her lover entered, and tenderly he pressed her hand and said, Come and lie down, my darling, and be happy. Hephaestos is no longer here, but gone to see his grunting Sintian friends on Lemnos. As she too thought repose would be most welcome, the pair went into bed, into a shower of clever chains, the netting of Hephaestos. So trust, they could not move apart, nor rise, at last they knew there could be no escape, they were to see the glorious cripple now, for Helios had spied for him, and told him, so he turned back, this side of Lemnos Isle, sick at heart, making his way homeward. Now in the doorway of the room he stood while deadly rage took hold of him, his voice, hoarse and terrible, reached all the gods, O Father Zeus, O gods and bliss forever here. Is indecorous entertainment for you, Aphrodite, Zeus's daughter, caught in the act, cheating me, her cripple, with Ares, devastating Ares. Cleanland beauty is her joy, not these bandy legs I came into the world with, 
No one to blame, but the two gods who bred me. Come see this pair entwining here in my own bed. How hot it makes me burn. I think they may not care to lie much longer, pressing on one another, passionate lovers, they'll have enough of bed together soon. And yet the chain that bagged them holds them down till father sends me back my wedding gifts, all that I poured out for his damned pigeon, so lovely, and so wanton. All the others were crowding in, now, to the brazen house, Poseidon who embraces earth, and Hermes the runner, and Apollo, lord of distance. The goddesses stayed home for shame, but these munificences ranged there in the doorway, and irrepressible among them all arose the laughter of the happy gods. Gazing hard at Hathiisto's handiwork the gods in turn remarked among themselves, no dash in adultery now. The tortoise tags the hare, Hathiisto's catches Ares, and Ares outran the wind. The lame god's craft has pinned him. Now shall he pay what is due from gods taken in cuckoldry. They made these improving remarks to one another, but Apollo leaned aside to say to Hermes, son of Zeus, beneficent wayfinder, would you accept a coverlet of chain, if only you lay by Aphrodite's golden side? To this the wayfinder replied, shining, would I not, though, Apollo of distances. Wrap me in chains three times the weight of these, come goddesses and gods to see the fun, only let me lie beside the pale, golden one. The gods gave way again to peals of laughter, all but Poseidon, and he never smiled. But urged Hephaestos to unpinion Ares, saying emphatically, in a loud voice, free him, you will be paid, I swear, ask what you will, he pays up every jot the gods decree. To this the great game legs replied, Poseidon, lord of the earth, surrounding sea, I should not swear to a scoundrel's honor. What have I as surety from you, if Ares leaves me empty, handed, with my empty chain? The earth, shaker for answer urged again, Hephaestos, let us grant he goes, and leaves the fine unpaid, I swear, then, I shall pay it. Then said the great game legs at last, no more, you offer terms I cannot well refuse. And down the strong god bent to set them free, till disencumbered of their bond, the chain, the lovers leapt away, he into Thrace, while Aphrodite, laughter's darling, fled to Kipro's isle and Paphos, to her meadow and altar dim with incense. There the graces bathed and anointed her with golden oil, a bloom that clings upon immortal flesh alone, and let her folds of mantle fall in glory. So ran the song the minstrel sang. Odysseus listening, found sweet pleasure in the tale, among the Phaeacian mariners and oarsmen. And next Alcanus called upon his sons, Halios and Laodamas, to show the dance no one could do as well as they, handling a purple ball carven by Polybos. One made it shoot up under the shadowing clouds as he leaned backward, bounding high in air the other cut its flight far off the ground, and neither missed a step as the ball soared. The next turn was to keep it low, and shuttling hard between them, while the ring of boys gave them a steady stamping beat. Odysseus now addressed Alcanus, O majesty, model of all your folk, your promise was to show me peerless dancers, here is the promise kept. I am all wonder. At this Alcanus in his might rejoicing said to the seafarers of Phaeacia, Attend me now, Phaeacian lords and captains, our guest appears a clear-eyed man and wise. Come, let him feel our bounty as he should. Here are twelve princes of the kingdom, lords paramount, and I who make thirteen, let each one bring a laundered cloak and tunic, and add one bar of honorable gold. Heap all our gifts together, load his arms, let him go joyous to our evening feast. As for Sir each, why man to man he'll make amends, and handsomely, he blundered. Now all as one acclaimed the king's good pleasure, and each one sent a squire to bring his gifts. Meanwhile Sir each found speech again, saying, My lord and model of us all, Alcanus, as you require of me, in satisfaction, this broadsword of clear bronze goes to our guest. Its hilt is silver, and the ring sheath of new, sawn ivory, a costly weapon. He turned to give the broadsword to Odysseus, facing him, saying blithely, Sir, my best wishes, my respects, if I offended, I hope the sea winds blow it out of mind. God send you see your lady and your homeland soon again, after the pain of exile. Odysseus, the great tactician, answered, My hand, friend, may the gods award you fortune. I hope no pressing need comes on you ever for this fine blade you give me in amends. He slung it, glinting silver, from his shoulder, as the light shone from sundown. 
Messengers were bearing gifts and treasure to the palace, where the king's sons received them all, and made a glittering pile at their grave mother's side, then, as Alcanuz took his throne of power, each went to his own high, back chair in turn, and said Alcanuz to Arate, Lady, bring here a chest, the finest one, a clean cloak and tunic, still these things, and warm a cauldron for him. Let him bathe, when he has seen the gifts of the Phaeacians, and so dine happily to a running song. My own wine, cup of gold and talio, I'll give him too, through all the days to come, tipping his wine to Zeus or other gods in his great hall, he shall remember me. Then said Arate to her maids, the tripod, stand the great tripod legs about the fire. They swung the cauldron on the fire's heart, poured water in, and fed the blaze beneath until the basin simmered, cupped in flame. The queen set out a rich chest from her chamber and folded in the gifts, clothing and gold given Odysseus by the Phaeacians, then she put in the royal cloak and tunic, briskly. Saying to her guest, Now here, sir, look to the lid yourself, and tie it down against light fingers, if there be any, on the black ship tonight, while you are sleeping. Noble Odysseus, expert in adversity, battened the lid down with a lightning not learned, once, long ago, from the Lady Kirk. And soon a call came from the bathing mistress who led him to a hip, bath, warm and clear, a happy sight, and rare in his immersions after he left Calypso's home, where, surely, the luxuries of a god were ever his. When the bathmaids had washed him, rubbed him down, put a fresh tunic and a cloak around him, he left the bathing place to join the men at wine and hall. The princess Nausicaa, exquisite figure, as of heaven shaping, waited beside a pillar as he passed and said swiftly, with wonder in her look, farewell, stranger, in your land remember me who met and saved you. It is worth your thought. The man of all occasions now met this, daughter of great Alcanus, Nausicaa, may Zeus the lord of thunder, Hera's consort, grant me daybreak again in my own country. But there in all my days until I die may I invoke you as I would a goddess, princess, to whom I owe my life. He left her and went to take his place beside the king. Now when the roasts were cut, the wine bowls full, a herald led the minstrel down the room amid the deference of the crowd and paused to seat him near a pillar in the center, whereupon that resourceful man, Odysseus, carved out a quarter from his chine of pork, crisp with fat, and called the blind man's guide, Herald. Here, take this to Demodokos, let him feast and be merry, with my compliments. All men owe honor to the poets, honor and awe, for they are dearest to the muse who puts upon their lips the ways of life. Gentle Demodokos took the proffered gift and inwardly rejoiced. When all were served, Every man's hand went out upon the banquet, repelling hunger and thirst, until at length Odysseus spoke again to the blind minstrel, Demodokos, accept my utmost praise. The muse, daughter of Zeus in radiance, or else Apollo gave you skill to shape with such great style your songs of the Achaeans, their hard lot, how they fought and suffered war. You shared it, one would say, or heard it all. Now shift your theme and sing that wooden horse Epios built, inspired by Athena, the ambuscade Odysseus filled with fighters and sent to take the inner town of Troy. Sing only this for me, sing me this well, and I shall say it once before the world the grace of heaven has given us a song. The minstrel stirred, murmuring to the god, and soon clear words and notes came one by one, a vision of the Achaeans in their graceful ships drawing away from shore, the torches flung and shelters flaring, Argive soldiers crouched in the close dark around Odysseus, and the horse, tall on the assembly ground of Troy. For when the Trojans pulled it in, themselves, up to the citadel, they sat nearby with long, drawn, out and hapless argument, favoring, in the end, one course of three, either to stave the vault with brazen axes, or haul it to a cliff and pitch it down, or else to save it for the gods, a vote of glory, the plan that could not but prevail. For Troy must perish, as ordained, that day she harbored the great horse of timber, hidden the flower of Achaia lay, and bore slaughter and death upon the men of Troy. He sang, then, of the town sacked by Achaeans pouring down from the horse's hollow cave, this way, and that way raping the steep city, and how Odysseus came like Ares to the door of Diphobos, with Menelaos, and braved the desperate fight there, conquering once more by Athena's power. The splendid minstrel sang it. And Odysseus let the bright molten tears run down his cheeks, weeping the way a wife mourns for her lord on the lost field where he has gone down fighting the day of wrath that came upon his children. At sight of the man panting and dying there, 
she slips down to enfold him, crying out, then feels the spears prodding her back and shoulders, and goes bound into slavery in grief. Piteous weeping wears away her cheeks, but no more piteous than Odysseus' tears, cloaked as they were, now, from the company. Only Alcanus, at his elbow, knew, hearing the low sob and the man's breathing, and when he knew, he spoke, Hear me, lords and captains of Phaeacia. And let Demodokos touch his harp no more. His theme has not been pleasing to all here. During the feast, since our fine poet sang, our guest has never left off weeping. Grief seems fixed upon his heart. Break off the song. Let everyone be easy, host and guest, there's more decorum in a smiling banquet. We had prepared here, on our friend's behalf, safe conduct in a ship and gifts to cheer him, holding that any man with a grain of wit will treat a decent suppliant like a brother. Now by the same rule, friend, you must not be secretive any longer. Come, in fairness, tell me the name you bore in that far country. How are you known to family and neighbors? No man is nameless, no man, good or bad, but gets a name in his first infancy, none being born, unless a mother bears him. Tell me your native land, your coast and city, sailing directions for the ships. You know, for those Phaeacian ships of ours that have no steersman, and no steering or, divining the crew's wishes, as they do, and knowing, as they do, the ports of call about. The world. Hidden in mist or cloud they scud the open sea, with never a thought of being in distress, or going down. There is, however, something I once heard Nosithus, my father, say, Poseidon holds it against us that our deep sea ships are sure conveyance for all passengers. My father said, some day one of our cutters homeward bound over the cloudy sea would be wrecked by the god, and a range of hills thrown round our city. So, in his age, he said, and let it be, or not, as the god please. But come, now, put it for me clearly, tell me the sea ways that you wandered, and the shores you touched, the cities, and the men therein, uncivilized, if such there were, and hostile, and those God-fearing who had kindly manners. Tell me why you should grieve so terribly over the Argives and the fall of Troy. That was all God's work, weaving ruin there so it should make a song for men to come. Some kin of yours, then, died at Ilion, some first-rate man, by marriage near to you, next. Your own blood most dear? Or some companion of congenial mind and valor? True it is, a wise friend can take a brother's place in our affection.